Uh, all right, thanks very much, Don, um, and welcome, folks. Uh, this is Write Like You Mean It, uh, content that says something. I am your host this afternoon. Uh, I'm Evan, and it's a pleasure to be with you. Uh, if you want to um, tweet angrily at me, praise me, or otherwise comment on the session, uh, my Twitter handle is there on the bottom. Um, I would love if folks would start just by uh, dropping a quick introduction in the chat. If you could let me know uh, your name, where you're located, uh, if you are with an organization that you want to identify with, uh, and your favorite kind of pie. Uh, so again, name, where you're located right now, organization you're with, and your favorite type or a favorite type of pie. Um, my name's Evan. I am in San Diego, California on traditional Kumaye land. Uh, and if I had to pick just one pie, I would probably go with a lemon meringue, which is closest to my heart. Um, so we're going to have some fun, hopefully, today. Uh, this is a session that's designed to be both informative and uh, entertaining. Um, it's always a little bit hard as a presenter when I can't see any of your faces, but please jump in in the chat. If you have questions, just throw them in as we go. I'll ask you for feedback. Uh, please do drop it in the chat as we go, and I'll do my best to interact and engage with you. Um, I see we've got some great um, pies coming in. We've got uh, Gail loves apple pie. Paula is a pecan pie fan. Chocolate peanut butter from Astrid. There we go, getting getting wild. Uh, Malia is a key lime pie fan. Uh, this is great. I love pie um, and uh, uh, keep sharing those favorite pies as we go here. Uh, so let's get right into it. Um, Couple of goals today. The first goal is we want to have fun. Uh, if this session isn't fun, then you are not learning. So hopefully I can achieve that uh, and deliver some fun and that you all will participate and have fun with me. Uh, we're going to explore what actually makes writing good and good in the sense of effective. Uh, and we're gonna cover some easy tricks. Uh, I say easy, they are technically simple tricks. Uh, the tr tricky part is remembering to use them. Uh, and sometimes figuring out how to best use them. We're going to do a couple of different sections here. The first section we're going to, I call remixes. We're going to look at some uh, examples of writing that is, in fact, really good writing, but uh, maybe the way I present it to you is, is not quite how you're used to it. Uh, we're going to talk a little bit about what actually makes people connect to writing and language. We're going to look at some case studies of effective uses of these. Uh, and hopefully, uh, if I don't bog myself down talking, we're going to get to a place where um, you all can uh, rework my writing. Uh, I do want to say just from the beginning, uh, we're, you know, in, in our world, we're constantly churning things out. We have rapid response to do. We've got uh, six emails to write. It is impossible for anyone to consistently deliver uh, writing that you're like, ooh, this is great. Um, I did see a, a fun stat. Uh, my mom on Facebook, of course, shared uh, this thing the other day that over the course of his lifetime, um, Pablo Picasso created something to the tune of 50,000 pieces of art, and maybe 500 of those are still considered relevant today. Um, hopefully we can hit a slightly better rate with our writing, um, but it's just a good reminder that like you're not going to do it perfectly every time and don't beat yourself up if you just need to get something out and you fall into advocacy uh, jargon language. I'm just going to pause real quick. Uh, we got some more pies coming in. I, I just want to share the love of pie. Uh, Karen is in Lake Tahoe. Uh, loves pumpkin or any custard. Karen, hit me up. I, I'm going to share my pumpkin pie recipe with you. I'm very proud of it. Uh, Emily, banana cream pie, a classic. Um, uh, uh, Delara shares anything in a pie crust. Uh, that's actually probably my feeling as well. So keep those pies coming. If you're if you're new, you're just arriving, uh, quick icebreaker in the chat. Please share with us your name, your location, if you feel like saying what org you're with. Uh, and uh, your favorite pie or just a favorite pie it can be hard to choose. So just to ground us uh, in, in all of uh, what we're trying to do, right? In, in our writing, we're trying to communicate information to folks and through communicating that information, get them to take action. So it's important just to understand how do we process information? 
the the first way that we process information is through our tactile senses uh right our physical senses now sight is the one that's going to be most commonly easiest for us to access through writing um but really in this case c is uh any of the other physical sensations can stand in here touch taste sound um touch taste sound sight smell there's the other one um right but again it through writing it's most easy typically to convey visual imagery uh, it's also typically the most reliable but once we get past that once somebody can experience what we're trying to share with them then they'll feel it in their intuitive body once they feel that something is true then it goes to our brain a lot of the time what we have is a problem where we try to appeal to people's logic and reason first and logic and reason don't actually then translate to intuitive belief. It goes the other direction. Uh, and the way that we get into that again is by giving them a physical sensation. Uh, and in this case, we're gonna say seeing it. Once we get those first three ingredients, they can see it or experience it physically. They'll feel it intuitively. They'll believe it in their head. And hopefully if we've achieved all of those, we've also given them something that they can repeat uh, because in the end, people sharing our message with their friends, with their families is where we're gonna see that spread, whether they're sharing it on social media, sharing it in person, uh, we want them to be able to repeat what, what it is that we told them. Now, something I wanna just start with uh, is that this is actually brain science. There's been some really interesting studies done. Uh, this is one that I was just reading uh, a few weeks ago that's really fascinating, which is um, these German researchers actually studied uh, whether poetry can generate a physiological response? And the answer was a yes, it does. A couple of the really interesting findings in this is that people hearing poetry, in this case, it was people hearing a recitation of poetry, uh, but it holds true across also reading, um, it, that that experience is capable of, in the words of the study, inducing peak emotional experiences. When we experience things emotionally, we're more likely to hold on to them and to value them. Uh, so if we can tap into that emotional experience that poetry can generate with our other writing, we can also tap into those peak emotional experiences. Um, I love uh, Keats' grave. This is the grave of poet John Keats here. Um, and he wanted this epitaph, here lies one whose name was writ in water. Uh, it's such an evocative phrase and something that makes you think like what is what does it mean for something to be writ on water um and it also uses some poetic devices that we'll talk about in a minute that help lock that into your brain um so that you carry it with you and can repeat it a couple of other things that we found uh there that we i was not part of this research team but that the research team found uh, in this particular study um is that uh Poetry can uh, create uh, chills and goosebumps, um, both of which are internal signaling messages, right? Uh, in, in the words of the study, that whatever's happening in the environment is pertinent to your fundamental concerns. We want to tap into people's fundamental concerns because that's going to give us the opportunity to get past all of the other stuff that they're having thrown at them, right? People are concerned about their basic needs all day. Do I have shelter? Do I have food? Uh, am I gonna be able to pay the bills? And if we can't get past those concerns, we're never gonna tap through. So the secondary piece of this is that if we can elicit that emotional and physiological re reaction, it increases the memorability, right? So if we can get into that fundamental concern region, it helps people remember what we shared with them in the first place. And this was, uh, again, uh, uh, the, the studies in here, all the slides will be made available um, to anybody who wants them. Uh, and it's a, it's a great study to check out and, uh, and read through. Long story short, if we're creating effective content, the most effective content is going to create a sensory experience for the reader. To uh, demonstrate that, we're going to play, as I said before, a little game of remixes. So I'm going to show you a piece of writing. It's a piece of writing that I feel confident pretty much everyone knows. Uh, and I want you to think about it for a second. 
um, and then just drop a uh, a star in the chat when you think you know what this piece of writing actually is. Jump here, if I can get the slide to go. Go on slide, there we go. So take a look at this. Once you think you know what this is, just drop a star in the chat. All right, starting to get some chats. All right, uh, Malia, hopefully I pronounced your name correctly. Um, please go ahead and tell us what that is. Just drop it in the chat. Well, we've got a lot of votes for pecan pie um, in this group. Uh, here is what this piece of writing actually is. It is, of course, the introduction to the Eagles Hotel California, which love or hate the Eagles. Uh, pretty much all of us have heard it is an enduring classic in no small part because it elicits uh, that physiological response right through the writing. I've provided the same basic information in my terrible rewrite there. Uh, however, uh, I didn't do it in a way that connects that puts people in that scene, right? So some of the things that the Eagles do, they actually appeal to multiple senses in this uh, opening line, right? Um, on a dark desert highway. So immediately we can be put into that car just, just through that line, right? And we know that it's dark. We know that it's night. Cool wind in my hair. Pretty much all of us at some point in our lives have been driving somewhere uh, with a window open. You can feel that cool wind. It like both the literal physical chills that it'll send, but also then just like the chills of it going through, right? Warm smell of coolisas rising up through the air. Even if you don't know what that means, which many people uh, historically have not, uh, you can still get that sensory experience of, a, of some kind of smell rising up, open to interpretation uh, if, if you're not familiar with the reference. Um, this song goes on to some, some pretty uh, esoteric descriptions of uh, drug addiction, right? But it's filled with these visual concepts uh, and sensory concepts, mirrors on the ceiling and pink champagne on ice, right? We can remember these lines because they actually call to mind an image. Whatever the image is you see, it pops something into your head and it puts you in that experience. So taking a look uh, as we go through here, right? Uh, as noted, obviously sight isn't the only physical sense. One of the reasons that we want to use sight, which I mentioned earlier, uh, is that sight, broadly speaking, is the thing that more people have a common experience of. Um, hearing uh, can be a little bit harder to, to tap into through our writing. Um, smell is very strongly associated with memory for humans. Um, but that can also mean that it triggers uh, much more specific uh, and much more risky things uh, where one person may have uh, a very positive experience of apple pie, for example, uh, because their grandma made it and it was like a special thing. Someone else may have had a traumatic experience and the smell of apple pie has been locked into their olfactory uh, and memory centers. Uh, and so the smell of apple pie triggers a traumatic experience. So Smell can be a little bit touchier. Um, taste, also highly subjective. Um, and then touch uh, is good, but can be uh, just a little bit harder to elicit. So most commonly what we'll find is if you're writing, you're thinking, how can I put somebody into this? Uh, that sight is going to be one of the easiest ways to do it. Um, but don't forget about these other ones and use them as is appropriate. Uh, I would love to hear just in the chat as we move on to this next one, if you have um, a particular smell or a particular sound that you either have a really strong positive association with or a really strong negative association with. 
Uh, so a, a sound or a smell that either makes you just like cringe or makes you really happy. I will tell you, uh, I was absolutely traumatized at the age of 10 when we moved to New England and I went to my first lobster boil and I saw them putting the live lobsters into the pot. Um, it was horrifying to me. And the smell of shellfish cooking puts me in that space of like emotional and moral outrage. Uh, and uh, so if somebody mentions, you know, a, a shrimp boil, um, I'm, I'm going to have a not the reaction they want if they're looking for a positive, uh, positive response. So uh, drop something in the chat if you've got one, a smell or a sound that just sends you off either in a good way or a bad way. So looking at our next uh, rewrite here, I want you to take a second, see if you can figure out uh, what famous, I'll, I'll tell you it's a song, what famous song this is from. Uh, go ahead and just drop that star in the chat uh, when you uh, have this one figured out. This is a little bit less old white guy music, so hopefully uh, a little more accessible. All right, we've got stars starting to come in. Let's see if we can get one or two more before I unveil it. Aha, Shana jumped the gun, but yes, Shana, you are correct. The, uh, the song that we are looking at, uh, the millennial national anthem, Mr. Brightside by The Killers, All right? So conveying the same basic information, but without any meaningful uh, connection. Now the killers do a bunch of things in this song that make this really effective writing. Uh, and I wanna look at a few of those beyond just the imagery that they provide, which is really strong, but they also do uh, some important things. One of the most important is the pacing of this song. Um, and one of the things that we often don't think about uh, when we're churning out some advocacy writing is like, how am I pacing this? What is the what is the flow of both the sentences and the wording, right? So this song is paced very intentionally to create that sense of anxiety. Uh, you have places where words are really drawn out uh, or sentences are longer, and then you have in the uh, in the main uh, the main verse you have this very staccato kind of frantic, now I'm falling asleep and she's calling a cab and they're having a smoke and she's taking a drag and I'm going to bed and my stomach is sick and it's all in my head, but she's touching his, hey, look, there's a surprise. We were expecting a rhyme. We didn't get it, right? We go to chest now and then we slow down again, right? So we're getting these visual images that can help us lock in. And then the way that they're pacing it and the word choice actually puts us emotionally into the singer's headspace. Um, really important to think about how am I pacing things? Uh, how am I structuring this to move it in the in the way and direction that I want and create that emotional resonance? I want to take a look. Uh, this one will be a little bit harder to do with only chat, but that's okay. Um, this is an excerpt from uh, one of my favorite Maya Angelou poems. And I just want you to read it for a minute and see where you catch and where it takes you in places uh, that you weren't expecting. So we'll just take a sec to read this. So as you're reading, I would love to hear in the chat um, what stands out to you. Where where do specific words or images pop and give you something that makes this uh, meaningful or interesting, catches you off guard? while we're giving folks a sec to drop some thoughts in there, I think, you know, a, one of the things that happens in this section of this poem that I think is particularly effective, um, as I've got on the right side of the screen here, expanding a viewpoint, is that it kind of literally takes your eye along the path that she's describing as she describes it, and first expands 
depth of view uh, in bringing in these, you know, the, the whole scope of the landscape, these gentle buttocks of a young giant of these hills. And then it brings you back down into this very specific narrow place in that crease where your focus gets brought back to this, uh, this very narrow picture um, of the old adobe bricks. Uh, Astrid shares, uh, I'm following it to the right, the first sentence, yeah, that allows you to visualize, visualize the landscape. The eye follows, literally your eye is following the words. Um, uh, uh, Paula agrees here, um, you know, it really, it draws your eye along the way that this is structured. I think one of the things that we often don't spend a ton of time thinking about, and particularly uh, this is valuable for email, is like what what is the actual structure other than like, I want my uh, call out box to be obvious and I want my ask above the fold, like really thinking about how are my sentences and my paragraphs structured and organized to make it easy to read and draw people through uh, my email. So we'll jump, uh, we'll jump on to the next one here. And I think another thing that we can often learn uh, from poetic or uh, musical writing um, is it's important to actually say what you're trying to say. Now, obviously poetry is renowned for uh, being full of metaphor and, and vagueness and, and strange things, but um, you do get uh, a, a core idea, hopefully from most things. And certainly in songwriting, um, folks are looking to get their point across most of the time. So I want us to think, uh, and we've got a, another example I'm going to show in a minute. Um, where do we tend to not quite say what we need to? Um, do we pull our punches by leaving somebody's name out or, or using passive voice? Are we softening language that could be more direct, right? Are we adding a whole bunch of words we didn't need because it makes it feel uh, more approachable? Um, are we hedging on our point? Uh, and here's an example, uh, very new, uh, of somebody who is getting right down to business in the song. Uh, this is from Lil Nas X's uh, newest album. Um, and just take a second to read this one. And then I just love uh, dropping the chat, anything that sticks out to you here, uh, anywhere that you find it, it particularly catches you or details that you um, that you notice. Yeah, Natasha shares, I, I told him, dad, I'm that one. You, you have this very specific conversation, right? Um, I think probably all of us at some point or another have had a, a disagreement of some sort with our parents about which direction we were going. Maybe they wanted us to be a doctor and we wanted to be a starving artist or a not starving artist. Uh, maybe something not as consequential, right? But he also builds it, um, in here with you know specific details. Yes, uh, Delara shares like face-to-face -face in Atlanta. He puts you in the location, right? It's not just like I had a face-to-face -face with my dad, right? It's where did I have that face-to-face -face with my dad? Um, you know, in 2018, I was in my sister's house the whole summer, not just like crashing with my sister, right? Like there's a, there's a different hit of, I was in my sister's house the whole summer. He may just mean he was sleeping there, but it, it puts you like he's stuck in that one small space, right? Um, and then the end, which is the, uh, the first part of the chorus, right? This song is called uh, Dead Right Now. Um, you know, you know, I never did you wrong, even though I'm right here by the phone, dog. You know, you never used to call. Keep it that way now, right? Now that I'm, you didn't used to call me. Now that I'm blowing up, you know what? Let's just leave it where it was. Um, it, it's a great track. If, you, if you're not familiar with it, I definitely encourage you to listen to it just because it's a great track, but also um, it's a great example of how to really 
say what you want to say and he does it mostly without getting too harsh uh, there is one uh pretty harsh uh um uh verse there's the word all i could think was stanza and i was like that's that's not the right word for songwriting um but it, very direct very blunt just you know what you've been leaving me alone let's just stick with it that way so okay that's all well and good poets can be poetic songwriters can evoke emotion how do i do that if i'm writing for advocacy well let's look at some examples of places where people writing for advocacy did that really effectively. I want to look first at one that doesn't really tap into these things. Um, so I'll just read the first part here. Um, Dear Evan Sutton, uh, ignore the problem with the formatting of my name, and that's my own fault. Um, a new report identifies the sources of the four most common foodborne pathogens. Of the four, two are most often found in chicken. And yet the USDA is willfully operating with historic shortages of food safety inspectors and poultry plants. Instead of trying to fill dozens of vacancy by vacancies by requesting a larger budget, this year the agency asked Congress for less money. Foodborne illnesses affect 48 million people and kill 3,000 annually. So why is the USDA short staffing its food inspection department? Uh, now there's a few things in here. This is not a terrible email. Uh, and it uh, is certainly very similar to many emails that I have received and continue to receive. Um, but just in reading it out loud, which is a great strategy to employ, uh, if you want to check your writing, just in reading it out loud, there's a number of words that I'm stumbling over. Um, I'm not quite pulled in. The sound of it doesn't have any kind of resonance. Um, and it's full of jargon. So let's look at an example from basically the identical campaign, but from a different organization. If I can just get the slides to go. Come on, baby, there we go. So just starting with the subject line on this email, right? The subject line is, oh crap, literally. Okay, you've got me, now I'm curious. What's going on here? Evan, in an attempt to keep the American people from eating shit, literally, the United States Department of Agriculture currently inspects all chicken and turkey carcasses for things like bruises, bile, and feces before they are sent to further processing. Now, if we go back to where we started, right, and we're trying to elicit goosebumps uh, or chills, I would, I would guess that most of you felt a little bit of goosebumps or chills from that first paragraph. Um, as I'm reading the rest of this, I'd love to have folks just drop in the chat any particular words that jumped out to you uh, uh, in this, right? So any words that jumped out to you, drop them in the chat as I read this next part. However, the USDA is now considering a pilot program that would eliminate that inspection and allow private poultry processing plants to do whatever they want. The USDA is holding a public commenting period on this proposed change through April 26th. Please click here to sign our petition opposing the privatization of poultry inspection. So, uh, uh, yes, as Alana notes, Daily Coast should be an inspiration. Now, many of us will never have the leeway to write an email quite this bold or hard hitting, um, but we can still learn from it. Uh, you may not be able to write that they're trying to keep people from eating shit, but you can look at words, right? In the previous email, they just talked about poultry. Here they talk about chicken and turkey. Simply breaking it down into the most common types of poultry that people use already makes it more accessible. And then they put very vivid words in here. Bruises, bile, feces, right? Carcasses, just referring to it as carcasses rather than meat or bodies, right? It takes it out of our usual experience and puts it into some, something very different. Um, so again, you may never have the chance to use some of the language here, but thinking about the word choice, another thing, and we're gonna talk about this in a little more detail a little later, is that this email is full of alliteration. There's a ton of repetition of sounds, uh, and the science shows that repeating sounds, uh, just like meter and rhyme, actually make things more memorable. So private poultry processing plants 
is actually creates a memorable line just through that alliteration. Uh, yeah, Paolo notes they're not sugarcoating it, um, right? There's there's no messing around in this email. They're not pulling any punches. Um, they're telling you exactly what's going on. And you know, in this particular instance, it's one of those things where like we have most of us completely outsourced that part of life, right? We don't have to deal with slaughtering animals. We don't have to deal with uh, cleaning of animals. We just get to go to the grocery store or the restaurant and like order our chicken and it comes out, you know, all nice. If, if we brought it home, you know, we have to wash our hands after we handle it, but we're not dealing with this stuff. And so putting that right in people's faces as something where like things could go real wrong um, is a great way to uh, really bring people into the need for the advocacy. So now looking at uh, another piece here, this is uh, from the Washington State Nurses Association blog. Um, I will call your attention to the date, April 7th, 2020. At this point, we're about three weeks. Uh, sorry, give me one second. I need to shoo my kids into the other room. Hey, kids, I am doing a training. I need you guys to be upstairs, please. Uh, uh, everybody just got home from school here in San Diego. Um, so, uh, again, this is about three weeks into um, the uh, the pandemic. We still don't know how it's spreading. We don't know, for example, that it's not really spread on surfaces. It's uh, droplet or airborne. Um, and this is a story we're trying to bring people into what the experience of healthcare professionals in this moment is. Um, I'm sure folks have been reading. If you've been reading ahead, uh, again, go ahead and drop in the chat any thoughts on how this affected you. But I'll just read the first little bit here, uh, the first paragraph. When I pull into my garage after my 13 hour shift, the first thing I do is strip off my scrubs. I throw everything I'm wearing into the washing machine, turn it to the sanitized setting and start it up. My shoes never come into the house. I walk through the house naked, straight to the shower, trying not to touch anything along the way. Skipping a couple paragraphs here to the last one. My youngest daughter is usually waiting for me to get home. She's been home from school for several weeks now. Her older siblings watch her when I'm at work, but like everyone else, her routine has been interrupted and she's trying to understand what's going on. She's a snuggler in normal times and now she's desperate for some extra attention. It breaks my heart to tell her, don't touch me until I shower. So thinking about this, and again, please do uh, drop in the chat. Uh, also, just a reminder, if you have questions as we're going, drop those in the chat. But um, if there's anything in particular in here that jumps out at you or that really puts you into that space, um, going back to the question of pacing, uh, if you look at this first uh, uh, paragraph, right, it's none of the sentences are complicated. At most, there's one paragraph, two clauses, right? Uh, it's very accessible. It starts with a, a familiar action of pulling into a garage. It sets you in that person's space by outlining that 13 hour shift. Uh, you know, uh, many of us don't have to work 13 hour shifts, thankfully, but all of us at some point have probably had that experience working a double in a restaurant when we were in college, uh, pulling an all nighter, doing advocacy work. Uh, working two jobs to pay the bills, right? We all know what it's like in some degree. So we're, we're put right in there. And then it's very active. The pacing is quick. It's active. It's direct about what she's doing. And so you can flow right through it. And then we get a little bit of just kind of who she is uh, as background. And then we get into this next emotional thing about how, do, how is this affecting the kids? Um, we get a little bit more about the youngest daughter, right, uh, being a snuggler and needing some extra attention and mom feeling like it's not safe for me to give her that attention until I've gotten clean after work. Um, it's a very different experience than just talking about frontline workers or, you know, PPE shortages when you can put someone into a story uh, and then make that story uh, effective in, in the sense of how it's being conveyed. Uh, Delara, remember this one. Awesome. Um, you know, it, it, when you hit something like that, that it will stick with you. Um, Paolo shares, the first paragraph really paints the picture clearly and it's relatable. My dad is a nurse and has a similar story, right? So it, it, when you tell a story, when you, when you bring it to life in this way, it'll also trigger other stories that people have heard or experienced. 
Um, Shana says, I was definitely the kid uh, wanting a hug. So heartbreaking. Yep. Um, absolutely. So looking at uh, another example here, um, this is uh, a, a voting rights one. Uh, hello, one in 2.3 million. Those are the slim chances voter fraud will occur in a federal election. There's a greater chance of being struck by lightning or attacked by a swarm of bees. But the way the proponents of voter suppression legislation talk about the issue, you'd think we were seeing millions of cases of voter fraud a year. Now I wanna actually pause there um, because the first three paragraphs, which are actually just one sentence each, uh, are, are super effective. And then the third, or the fourth one kind of loses its, um, uh, its punch, so to speak. So opening up, right, we have this, uh, not even really a sentence, um, one in 2.3 million. Okay, what's one in 2.3 million? That was also the subject line for this, right? So opening up with something that's uh, going to inspire a little curiosity and also then showing this kind of surprising statistic, right? Because the way that people talk about it is like, oh, voter voter suppression is, or uh, 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 voter fraud is everywhere, right? So there's a greater chance of being struck by lightning or attacked by a swarm of bees. Those are both things that we all have imagined happening to us at some point as children or adults, right? They're, they're physical things, but they're also things that even though we may be worried about them, in our lizard brain, we know are like actually extremely rare. Very few of us, if any of us, have ever known someone who is struck by lightning. Uh, getting attacked by a swarm of bees is a, a freak accident, right? But then we get into the place where it starts losing its way a little with uh, some language that's both pulling punches and uh, a little distant, right? The proponents of voter suppression, suppression legislation. What on earth does that mean? We could simplify a lot of this uh, pretty easily, but even with some of the jargon that we get into down here, uh, it still is gonna draw people in and present what's actually a very complicated topic in a way that can put people into that scene, right? Can give people something tangible to experience. Um, one thing that I do often see and just would caution folks to be aware of is this same thing, right? Where you, you think, okay, I've got this great opening. I've got a hard hitting, strong, vibrant opening. And then you kind of like slide into some more jargony, activisty language because you're like, wow, I got that thing. So always read back all the way through and just be like, hey, where, where am I dropping the ball? If I am, maybe you wrote the whole thing uh, the right way. So taking a look at another one here, right? Um, this is from just not, uh, hey, hey, look, it's exactly a month ago, um, right? This great debate about are people lazy uh, and not working because there was uh, uh, lots of assistance. So AOC, uh, grand maestra of this work, um, right? You can't force people to work a job that doesn't pay enough to live. This isn't hard. What's the point in working a $7.25 or even $15 an hour job if the childcare needed costs almost as much as one's paycheck? Then, so that, that's good. I would rate that one as good. The second one though, is really where she puts you into that. Now we've all been inundated with story after story of the like chaos that's happening out there, um, especially you know people attacking uh, uh, frontline service workers. So. She puts it in the form of a question here. Would you sign up for a job to get attacked by unvaccinated tourists for $15 an hour for no healthcare but max risk? Most wouldn't. CEOs lobbying to end PUA should try it. The pandemic has workers not only asking, is it worth the pay, but also, is it worth my health and safety? Right? So the second one, one of the really great tricks is just asking people a question. Well, would you do this? Right? Would would you be comfortable eating chicken if you knew it hadn't been expected and there might be poop on it? Uh, would you sign up for this job? Uh, putting people into that real experience uh, and, and creating a story here 
takes it out of kind of the like, oh, workers don't want to work. Uh, you know, workers are lazy on the one hand or like, oh, the pandemic's still raging on the other. And it puts it in the like, what does that actually look like for a frontline worker? Just gonna continue to remind folks, if you have questions, if you have thoughts, if anything's jumping out at you, uh, please just drop them in the chat. Um, again, these are uh, always a little bit more challenging when uh, we can't see each other and, and interact a little bit more fruitfully. So uh, please bring that interaction uh, wherever you find it. I loved this one. Uh, it doesn't have anything to do with activism, uh, but it just was so funny and visceral um, right, you've got this uh, person tweeting thought-provoking episode with Barry Weiss on Brian Stelter's podcast on cancel culture and its ramifications. Uh, and Robin, Robin tweets, I would rather lick a porcupine. Um, that's like, you, you literally think, like you imagine yourself like, ooh, lick a porcupine. Ugh, if I had to lick a porcupine, which direction would I lick it? Ugh, how would I hold a porcupine to lick it? Where would I find a porcupine? Right? It's so surprising and just puts you in this weird space. Uh, and it's super effective. Uh, you're probably never going to tweet for your organization, I would rather like a porcupine, but just having it in the back of your head is the ex an example of the kind of thing that can be really punchy, uh, very visceral, um, and just put someone into that like, oh, that sounds horrible, or hey, that sounds great. Uh, hopefully not great to licking porcupines. Um, Often, uh, you know, you've all heard less is more. Less is not always more, but sometimes less can really drive a point home in a way that more can't. So we've looked at some effective writing outside of advocacy. We had some poems, we had some songs. We've looked at some effective writing inside advocacy. I wanna look at a couple of pieces uh, of additional psychology around communication and language. Um, and uh, some tricks and tips that we can all just put in our toolbox for reviewing our own writing and, and just saying, did I do this thing? And if not, how can I? So again, at the beginning, we talked about that uh, belief goes from intuitive belief to logical belief and not really the other way, right? So we have to remember always, how do we get to that intuitive belief so that the logical brain can open to something? I want folks to just take a second to read this sentence. Uh, when you have read the sentence and think you understand what it says, just please drop a star in the chat. Uh, we'll give folks a second here. Again, drop a star in the chat when you feel like, okay, I get what that's saying. This one always takes a minute. All right, I'm gonna show you a slight reworking of this same sentence as you're thinking about it. Usually if we were all in a room together, people would start chuckling here, um, right? Using the exact same information to drive home the point that it's making, right? Uh, you have to stop and think about this sentence on the left. You gotta like, okay, what, okay, what? The sentence on the right, I don't have to stop and think about at all. That's quick and easy. Uh, no matter how much we may wanna write white papers and factual evidence-based claims, if people can't quickly and easily grasp what we're saying to them, they're not intuitively going to want to trust it. Now, part of that is because literally our brains turn off when things get too complicated. Uh, when we start getting too much stimulus, we sh either we either shut down or we blow up, right? Um, but one of those two options, it puts us into a fight, uh, fight flight mode uh, and we are not able to process information in an effective way. So 
what can we do to get into information people easily trust and out of excessive complexity? Oh, that's right. I forgot that I had these randomly animated and now I have to click all the way through. I've got to turn that off next time. So one thing that we can do is use active verbs. Now I'm actually including in this example, um, a, a counter. This is passive voice. Uh, we use passive voice a lot. It is very normal and it's counterproductive. Uh, in a best case scenario, passive voice lets people off the hook for actions that they've taken. In a worst case scenario, people use passive voice to intentionally shield themselves from responsibility. So in this case, Governor Asa Hutchinson, um, after having uh, signed a mask, man, uh, a mask mandate uh, ban, says, in hindsight, I wish that had not become law, right? Well, buddy, you're the one who signed that law. Uh, in hindsight, I wish it had not become law. Like things becoming law, just, you know, a bill just kind of floats through and, oh, look, that one became a law. Oh, that one became a law. Um, we very often, I can't tell you how many times I get things uh, to, to edit. And the first thing I do is just turn it around and say, go back through this, get rid of passive voice and use active verbs everywhere. Active verbs will force you to reframe uh, the work that you've done. And they'll also make you think critically about how do I tell a story with this work? And if we're telling a story, then we're creating an experience people can be part of. Here's a, a great example of how active verbs can reframe something to think about who's actually the person taking action. Now, we're all uh, doing it with a positive thought, but uh, as Wagatwe points out here, when we say black women have to work more to earn the same, the person taking action is that is actually the black woman, which puts us in our headspace in that person has uh, culpability or um, a role that they're playing in that. Even if we feel like that's inherently unfair, it still puts that person as the actor and the actor is always part of the, uh, of the situation. But when we reframe it to employers steal seven months of wages from black women, that creates a very different story. And I would argue a much more effective story, both because it's more accurate, right? Like it's not just a natural outcome that black women have to work more to earn the same or that they want to work more to earn the same, or in most cases that they have a choice to work more to earn the same, right? There's somebody creating that situation and when we think about it, about who is the real actor and we use an active verb to describe it, then all of a sudden we, we create a very different story that people can participate in. So once you've reviewed your writing for active verbs, uh, think about familiar words. How can I make something closer and closer to a language that people use, but also the most recognizable version, right? So Nicole here starts, this is a fine tweet, right? I can, I mean, who can blame? People need money. Our inaction is unconscionable. Clear, direct to the point. But Doug weighs in and, and puts it in a new and more familiar context, baby formula. They're stealing baby formula, right? By getting down to the most real thing that's happening and the most uh, uh, con literally in this case consumable um, uh, language, then you're again putting people into a story that they can naturally understand and get to. Everyone understands that if someone is stealing baby formula, they're in pretty dire straits, right? So talking about it in that very uh, distinct and clear way, helps create uh, a visualization that will put people into the scene and make the need for activism feel real. The third key trick is to use vivid words, uh, words that really pull people out. Like in the uh, Daily Coast email where we saw them talking about turkey and chicken carcasses instead of talking about poultry, right? Where they talked about uh, feces, bile, and bruises rather than foodborne pathogens, right? 
In this case, uh, Tim tweets, the cure can't be any worse than the disease. What's the cure? Stay home and watch Netflix. What's the disease? Your lungs get coated with a white slimy film and you drown in your own mucus. Wait, how long do I have to stay home and watch Netflix? All right, it's, it's very different talking about you know, pneumonia or the ICU or going on a ventilator, which are all accurate, right? But if you say you're going to drown in your own mucus, that's just a, a whole different world of like, woo, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm going to have a reaction to that. I'm going to generate that emotional and physical response that's going to make it memorable and that are, that's going to make it effective. So again, our top three tricks. We want to use active verbs, we want to use familiar words, and we want to use vivid words. Once we've gotten through those three things, there's another set uh, of literary and poetic devices that can be super helpful for making our writing effective. The big ones. Pacing. We've talked about it, right? How quick or slow? What's the interplay of the sentences and the paragraphs? Repetition. Right. This is the reason uh, or, or a reason, for example, that uh, Dr. King's I have a dream speech is super effective. Right. Is the repetition. I have a dream that I have a dream that I have a dream that. And it puts you uh, through the repetition and the rhythm in particular into a specific place and makes it very memorable. Uh, alliteration, as we covered, actually triggers the brain and makes things more memorable. Don't go crazy with alliteration because it will drive people crazy. Uh, but if you have places where you can uh, slide it in efficiently, it's a really effective tool. Rhyme is another one, right? It's it's going to be a little bit hard to get rhyme into advocacy language, uh, but do occasionally look for opportunities uh, to to fit in words that sound alike that have similarity. Um, similarly, rhythm, right? We're going to see more uh, of a pacing based rhythm than a uh, like a poetic meter based rhythm in advocacy language but do think about what's the rhythm of the writing that i've got here how does it roll and the best way to figure out both pacing and rhythm is to literally just read it out loud to yourself uh, when you're done writing it uh, the final one of these is structure literally how is my writing organized to make the key points pop out to make it more accessible uh, merely putting, uh, splitting a sentence into uh, two sentences into, instead of a sentence with two long clauses, um, taking a clause out and instead of making it, you know, set aside with an M dash or parentheses, making it its own sentence. Um, these are little things that can make uh, the physical structure affect how it lands. Uh, the biggest one I think in advocacy writing is most commonly just split up your bigger paragraphs, right? especially as more and more of us are reading on our phones uh, or scrolling through a computer screen really quickly. If you see a hefty paragraph, uh, most of us are just going to jump out of it. Like, uh, I, I don't have the time to read that. And if you think about it on your phone, a hefty paragraph, anything more than two sentences probably fills your phone screen. And if they're long sentences, uh, two sentences might fill your phone screen and, and turn somebody off. Uh, I love this example. Uh, Langston Hughes's Harlem um, for the all of these examples of all of these. Particularly, I really like what he does with the structure here, uh, the way that the lines are laid out and broken. Um, even just the fact that the top line uh, is longer than the following lines, right, and that they're inset uh, and and run really long and straight. Um, this poem would probably land somewhat differently if each of the questions was just a single line, right? Or if it were just aligned differently. So literally looking at an email, a blog post, uh, even a tweet and thinking, okay, what can I do to like organize this in a way that might help with the flow or give people a way to read it that's a little bit different? Um, there's also funny ways, right, that you can mess with uh, with structure in particular, right? Uh, there was a great uh, um, uh, example of a Rickroll. I'm a big fan of the Rickroll, right? Where you, you'll see these where uh, the first word of each line made uh, the, the chorus of Rick Astley's classic, 
never going to give you up. Um, you, just thinking about stuff like that right now with with online writing, uh, be careful playing with structure because unless you actually hard code it into your code, you don't know, right? Like something that um, you you set up each line to be just how you want it to be, uh, but you didn't hard code it. And so somebody's reading it on a phone and the line breaks a line differently than on a laptop than on a tablet. Um, so be a, a little more careful with structure if you're doing online writing. I wanna just kind of pause. I just ran through a bunch of stuff would love uh, jump in with questions if you've got them here. The next section is going to be rewriting crappy pieces of my own writing. Um, but if you've got questions, if you've got comments or concerns, uh, just jump right in uh, in the chat. So as a, I'll give a sec for those to come in, but uh, the next part is I want you to use the information that we've covered now and. Uh, as I noted, nobody can write great, compelling writing every time. Uh, all of us sometimes just need to churn something out or it's not our best day or we just don't have the energy to think about it. Uh, and so all of the next three things I'm going to show you are things that I wrote and that went out in an email or a press release or a blog post uh, and are living out in the world somewhere. And I'm gonna ask you to apply the principles that we just learned to make these better. Uh, just take a minute for each one. Think about, uh, you might want to just think about, okay, if I changed all the verbs to active verbs, how would I rewrite this? Or can I make some of these more familiar words? Or can I use vivid words to bring this to life? Right? So take a minute um, and we'll see if folks have some ideas of ways using those again. Vivid words, active <clears throat> Uh, vivid words, active verbs, and familiar words to fix my not so great writing. And while you're doing that and dropping those ideas in the chat, uh, I'm going to have a sip of water. Great. Dilara, thank you. Uh, points out that a couple of phrases or words in here that are maybe uh, could use some some more familiar words include systems and patient outcomes. Those are absolutely ones that are types of things we say a lot. Uh, student outcomes, patient outcomes, right? What does that actually mean? How do we make that more uh, familiar? And the word system or systems or systemic um, at this point has been used so aggressively in advocacy writing that I think many of us just gloss over of it, gloss over it. What is the system? What is it comprised of? Can we bring that together? Uh, Dolores says, I also wrestle with a more familiar way to say access to healthcare. Yeah, you use it all the time, right? We, we talk about uh, access to this or access to that um, when we should in fact be thinking about how do I talk about the actual uh, end product here. Astrid says, we believe everyone deserves affordable quality healthcare. Great. You can even shave that down, right? Like belief is not actually that active. It's not a, a it's not taking action. Um, so could we swap something, uh, something in so that instead of believing something, it shows us taking action. Um, there's lots of different ways that that this could be rewritten, just just little tweaks like fixing some of the words. Alana points out you could say people's health, uh, right? Instead of patients, patient outcomes uh, based on uh, people's health, right? One of the the most boiled down version of this that you see a lot of uh, healthcare advocacy organizations, especially healthcare unions, using uh, is patients before profits. Like, wow, boiled this down to three words, right? You can also think about um everyone should be able to see the doctor right if you're thinking about like how do i make it more familiar or more active think about what does it mean if you have access to quality affordable health care well it means that if you're sick you can go to the doctor right um everyone deserves says astrid that's right 
like just just stating rather than saying we believe just stating everyone deserves this uh this thing everyone deserves to be able to go to the doctor um great these are all awesome ideas so moving on to another one uh for this next one before i show it to you i'm going to invite you to think about um the point that i ended on uh of what is it what does it look like in the real world who's the end user um because this one can be rewritten very effectively uh, if you just think about what what is the opposite in the real world. So take a sec to absorb that one and then drop some ideas for how to uh, bring that to life with active verbs, vivid words, familiar words. That's right. Yes, Delara. Thank you. Lack appropriate nutrition is hungry kids. So how could we like completely flip this on its head? Like what Gottway did with uh, uh, black women have to work versus employers are stealing. How can we just flip this one around to put the hungry kids front and center? Anybody got a quick sentence that comes off if the action is coming from or sent around hungry kids. One way I often have people reframe this is actually in a question, right? So uh, as we noted, uh, questions can be an effective way to draw people in. Uh, if I turn this into a question, it might be, can you focus when you're hungry? Neither can kids, right? Astrid suggests hungry kids don't learn well. Studies show hungry kids have trouble in school, right? All of these are significantly better than what I've got here and much more uh, much more direct. They tell a story. They put people into it. Everybody has been hungry at some point in their life. Everybody has been in a situation, whether it was in school or at work, uh, where they were hungry and struggling because of it, right? Some of us get hangry. Uh, it's a well-known enough phenomenon that we have a portmanteau for it. Um, and, right, sometimes just asking people to put themselves in that situation with a question uh, can be really effective. Often what I find is that for people who are, you know, maybe kind of on the fence, either they haven't thought about something, uh, they haven't thought about it in depth, or they've been fed some misinformation around it. If you start with a question to invite them in and put them in that situation, uh, that uh, they are more receptive to what you're uh, putting in front of them. So a third one, uh, this one, one of my uh, <laughs> one of my least effective sentences. Um, this is uh, during the 737 Max crisis. Just to break down a few of the things here, uh, and folks may have had been reminded of this uh, earlier, I guess earlier this week or at the end of last week, when one of the key players at Boeing was actually um, uh, actually found to have misled. Uh, inspectors, but basically over the last 30 years, uh, the FAA has increasingly, due to budget cuts, had to outsource responsibility to the airlines, uh, or to the, to the not the airlines, but the um, aircraft manufacturers. So now a significant amount of the review of new aircraft is actually handled by people employed by Boeing or by Lockheed or by Airbus, and they go to the FAA and they say, yeah, we certify that this thing is safe. So that's the situation that uh, that we're putting in here. Um, this one's a little bit more challenging. Uh, so thoughts on places that you could um, make this more accessible again using 
uh, active verbs, using vivid words, uh, using familiar words. There's, uh, there's lots of unfamiliar stuff. Uh, Gabriella, I will absolutely share this presentation. Uh, I believe there will be a recording of the actual session, but uh, you can also, uh, I'll have my contact information up um, and you can hit me up uh, and I'll happily share the slides. So what are some things in here, I, either wholesale restructuring or individual places that you could say, hey, wait a minute, let's fix that. Uh, let's fix the way you're talking about that, man. Also, sorry for the lighting. This is the time of day that the sun comes through the window and bounces off the wall behind me. So I get it from both above and behind. Uh, and unfortunately, that window does not have any curtains and I can't put any on it. As you're thinking about it, I think this is one where, um, similar to the Maya Angelou poem, taking a step back first could be really helpful. Um, this is, you know, very much uh, in focused in on this specific crisis. But if we think about it, most people don't really trust corporations broadly. Uh, what is the core thing we want to talk about here? It's product safety and who should be in charge of saying whether something is safe. Uh, aviation is a field in which people have uh, particular uh, affinity for safety. Uh, people feel very viscerally uh, about airplanes, even the, the most confident flyers. Nobody likes turbulence. Nobody likes to think that maybe their plane wasn't carefully inspected or reviewed. Um, so just taking a step back to think about, could I say something bigger, like corporations can't be trusted to say whether or not their own products are safe, right? But that's what we let airline companies do. We shouldn't anymore, right? Just, just pulling way back sometimes and giving a bigger picture and then diving in can be really effective. Um, I'd love to hear just, you know, if you've got a specific word in here somewhere that you're like, ah, no, no, fix that one. Um, or a phrase that doesn't, doesn't really land for you and an idea for how to fix it. Uh, this is again, one of those places. It would be great if we could uh, be in a room together chatting about it. Uh, but here we are and we're going to make the best of it. Uh, also, as you're thinking about that, feel free to throw questions as always into the chat. Uh, we're coming toward the end of the session here. Uh, so if you do have questions about anything we've covered, uh, by all means, start dropping them in. Yep, Delar shares, uh, I like undermine and starve government. Um, that's actually active, right? Um, now, I think undermine is one of those ones that like we, we use a lot and conceptually people get. Um, but I would think about if I were redoing this, maybe I just drop undermine. Maybe I just go to starve government, uh, right? Uh, I don't need undermine necessarily there and it's not it's not active in a sense of like i don't picture someone literally you know digging out the foundation uh under there where starve feels visceral to me um so that's one of those that we use a lot but i would be cautious if, if you see it in your own writing think about how is this helping me and do i need it sometimes it's just a, an extra word or one that we use when we're feeling lazy and don't want to come up with a more active verb I think, you know, one of the things uh, in here, you know, something I've got some passive voice here, uh, system that was put in the hands of the corporation to maintain. Well, who put it in the hands of a corporation to maintain? Can we take it back from the hands of the corporation? Um, maintain is another one that uh, gets used a lot in advocacy language. We're going to maintain this uh, or maintain that. And uh, we, we don't really... What does maintain mean? Is somebody like literally 
a maintenance person going in there with wrenches? Uh, in this case, no. Uh, so unless you literally mean a maintenance person, uh, probably don't use the word maintain. Uh, thank you, Don, for clarifying that. The presentation will be available through the app um, along with the recording of the session, and that'll be within a week. Uh, so excellent. If you need it sooner than a week, my contact info will be up in another slide or two, uh, and you're welcome to reach out to me directly. All right. So I'm going to jump to uh, a final bit of information. Uh, when you're going through your writing, you've, you've written something, you're like, OK, now I'm going to go back and review, see how I did. Ask yourself some questions. Can I see or in some other way sense what I wrote? Uh, if, if you have a physical response, that's a great sign. If you don't have a physical response when you've read through, think about it. And I encourage you strongly to read it out loud to yourself uh, when you are doing that initial review and before you uh, put it out into the world. Um, second question, did I, did I pace my writing to draw people along with me? Did I intentionally think about how my sen sentences and my paragraphs flow? The third one, did I anchor my writing in a story? We didn't talk about this explicitly, but it came up over and over. In here right that if we're telling a story that helps lock it in for people and it makes it accessible you don't always have to have a story uh, don't kill yourself to find a story or make up a story but if the, you can anchor it in a story that's going to help you do all of the other pieces as well uh, another key question is will i catch people off guard somehow did i ask a question did i include information that they didn't have did I phrase something in a way that's going to make them think about it differently? Uh, you know, looking again at the AOC tweet, for example, simply by putting it into the real world lived experience, would I take a $15 an hour job if I was going to get assaulted by maskless, unvaccinated tourists? Ugh, I don't know. That sounds terrible. I don't think I want that job. Right? Maybe I'll hold out and, and find something else. Uh, or, oh gosh, yeah. I can understand why somebody wouldn't want that job. Um, the final one, again, would this be easy to summarize? If you've done the other parts well, then somebody should be able to repeat it. Uh, and again, that's in the end what we need is people, whether they're mashing that retweet button or talking to their friend over a beer, which thankfully many of us can do now, uh, right? Can somebody say the key points uh, and the things that are going to make that easy to do are the tricks that we learned along the way here. So these are just a handful, you know, you don't have to review uh, uh, every single slide that we've covered all of the pieces. If you're going to ask yourself even half of these questions every time you write something, it'll put you in that space to be constantly improving your writing in a way that's going to make it more effective uh, in the real world and more fun for you. Um, I don't know about you all, but I get tired of uh, writing boilerplate over and over. Um, I, you know, you get in that rut, you just keep doing it. When you're thinking about it creatively, it makes it more interesting and more fun, and it makes our work uh, more engaging for us as well as more effective in the world. So we have come to the end. Uh, we're we're going to wrap up a few minutes early. So hopefully, whether you're uh, on the East Coast and getting ready for dinner or like me on the West Coast and need to wrap something up before the end of the day, uh, hopefully the few minutes will be great, but um, I'd love to hear just a little bit about anything that's sticking with you. Uh, this is the last chance to ask questions uh, as well. While you've got me on video anyway, you can always shoot me a text or an e a tweet or an email and I'll be happy to engage, but uh, throw out if you've got uh, any particular takeaways that uh, you've got or any questions. Uh, you're welcome to Lara, and thank you, and thank everyone. I don't think that's a takeaway, but uh, always appreciate it. Uh, and it's uh, always great to be able to hang out with people who care about making their write writing better. Gail, thank you as well, and you are also welcome. If folks don't have any questions uh, or anything in particular that you want to share for a debrief, I'm just going to put my contact info up here. Uh, that's obviously my email on top and my Twitter handle on the bottom. Again, feel free to reach out. Uh, I'm happy to answer questions or bounce ideas around. Um, and uh, uh, 
without seeing any questions coming in, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Uh, Don, thank you again for keeping an eye on us and uh, sharing the uh, information. Uh, Astrid, thank you. Um, my own work uh, is terrible at least half, if not more of the time. Uh, so uh, I like to use my own uh, to give people that real world example. I'm glad it landed for you. Um, and uh, Don, I think you can go ahead and take us, uh, take us to the end here.